Hey, how's it going? It's Patrick Mitzling. And I'm Jared Whitefish. And today we're going to be reading Hiawatha and the Peacemaker. A fierce scream echoed through the woodlands. Was it a dream? An eerie steam crept up from the ground, and the smell of burning pine filled the air. My blurred vision came into sharp focus. Everything I had ever known had been buried to the ground. My wife and three beautiful daughters had been killed in battle. Everything was gone. Only one man was capable of such horror. The evil chief, Tatatoho. I took shelter up the river. I had only had a small fire and a place to sleep. I dressed my wounds with leaves I gathered from the bush. Days, then weeks went by. Consumed by anger and hunger and sleeplessness, I could only think of revenge. The sun rose early one morning and burned the mist off the river. It was as if the path had been cleared for what had happened next. A blinding reflection came off the water, and from it a man paddled gently toward me. As he reached the shore, I realized the reflection was caused by the sun hitting his hand-carved white stone canoe. Who are you? Why have you come here? I asked. He answered only with a smile and handed me a string of wampon shells as an offering. We stood quietly observing each other, and then he spoke softly, stumbling over his words. I, I, I know of your pain. I know of your loss. I carry a message of healing. I, I have come to tell you of the great law. Fighting among our people must stop. We must come together as one body, one mind, one heart. Peace, power, and righteousness shall be the new way. I considered his words, but I didn't believe him. Our people govern only through fear. I'd never thought of peace among our tribes was a possibility. The man spoke again. Travel with me to the land of the Mohawk and let us spread the good word. As you can hear, my voice is quiet and my words are difficult to understand. I know you speak with power and confidence. That's why your voice carries sh straight to the heart. I need your help, my friend. I need you to help me carry this message. I agreed to travel with him and help him carry his message. And so I, Hiawatha, came to tell the story of the great peacemaker. I stared at his stone canoe, bewildered by its ability to float, and we paddled off. And with every impossible moment that the canoe glided across the water, I became more of a believer. When we arrived at the land of my people, the Mohawk, we were greeted warmly. The chief and the elders were summoned, and we gathered in a circle. A few clan mothers looked on us with curiosity and concern. The peacemaker closed his eyes and placed his hand on my back. Somehow, he had the power to move his message through me. I began to speak his words. Peace, power, and righteousness shall be the new way, I said. We must join together. All nations will become one family. Our people shall have one body, one mind, and one heart. This is the message of the great law. The clan mothers nodded in agreement, and a sense of relief spread over me. But then the war chief spoke. We respect your message, but we cannot join you, he said. How can we know if your words are true? Tadadaho is strong, too violent. Our people must be prepared to fight. The peacemaker quietly stuttered. The great law is more powerful than any one man. We will return with proof that our nations can join together. As the peacemaker and I traveled toward the land of the Cayuga, he spoke to me of healing through forgiveness. My mind still filled with hatred and my heart still filled with pain of my loss could not comprehend this. When we arrived, we learned that the Cayuga tribe had been devastated and attacked by Tadadaho and his warriors. My mind was flooded with images of the battle that had taken my family. Rage filled my body. I turned to the peacemaker and yelled, We will never be free! In an attempt to soothe me, the peacemaker asked me to sit with him in the Cayuga council. He looked deep into my eyes. He spoke to my people. I... I do not see defeat, he said. What I see is a passage, a passage to a new life. Join me and together we can spread peace rather than war. 
love rather than hate, unity rather than fear. The peacemaker placed his fist over his heart. A feeling of strength and trust ran down my spine. With new hope, we headed toward the great hill to see the Seneca people. That Cayuga chief followed us in his canoe. Together, we paddled as one nation. We were met by 15 armed braves. For the first time, the peacemakers showed signs of worry. We were surrounded by warriors and led to the center of the Seneca village. The Seneca chief approached a circle, and the guards closed in on us. With a wave of his hands, the warriors lifted their spears. But then he nodded, and the guards drove their spears deep into the dirt. The Seneca chief sat down and told us that the wind had carried our message from the land of the Cayuga. The Seneca people wanted to learn about the peacemaker and the great law. We will all perish if we continue this violence. A change must come, and the time is now. Alone, we will be broken, I said. But together, we are more powerful than the greatest warrior. The Seneca chief trailed us in his canoe. Guided by the moon, we trekked through the forest to the land of the Oneida people. We were halfway to the camp when the snap of a stick was heard through the trees. Suddenly, the earth beneath our feet gave way. We hit the ground and were then engulfed by a giant net. The Oneida chief stood towering over us. I have spared your life, he declared. Why would two chiefs and two strangers be so foolish as to enter our territory in the darkness? His men dragged us through the dirt and bound our hands. The peacemaker explained that we had joined the Cayuga and the Seneca nations in the name of peace, but his words had no power over the Oneida. Then the peacemaker turned to me and said, Tell, tell your story, Hiawatha. Tell us of your great loss. I spoke of my pain and my hatred for Tadalaho. I told the Oneida that my wife and three daughters had been killed by the violent world we had created. But as I spoke, I felt something come over me, forgiveness. I had not been able to save my family, but on this journey I have been able to forgive myself. I began to understand the meaning of the great law, and I turned to the peacemaker and placed my fist over my heart with a knowing nod, he smiled. A warrior approached us, and he untied all of us, one by one. Rather than feeling the anger that consumed me, I now remember the joy of my family. I was joined by the Cayuga chief and the Seneca chief and the peacemaker, and lastly, the Oneida chief. Together, we traveled as three nations. The time had come to return to the Mohawk people with proof of our message. When we arrived, they were impressed to see three chiefs with us. The clan mothers had a glowing look of approval. But the Mohawk chief told us that the word of our mission had traveled to Tadadaho. His evil is too great, he said. Your message will only bring harm to our people. Angered by his lack of faith, the United chief pressed the sharpened tip of his staff under the chin of the Mohawk chief. We, we no longer use violence, said the peacemaker, as he reached out and lowered the staff from under the chief's chin. The peacemaker led us to the tallest oak that towered over the Mohawk River. I will climb this tree, he said, and your men shall cut it down. But I will not perish. The river will catch my body and carry it to safety. Then you will know that my words are true. The men chopped down the massive tree. It crashed into the icy waters and the peacemaker vanished. I stood silent, stunned by this foolish stunt. I feared the peacemaker had sacrificed himself at a critical point in our journey. An elder clan mother approached a circle of chiefs with four younger women by her side. This man has come with a message of peace and unity, but you greet him with closed ears and closed mind, she said. You reject Tadadaho, but you behave just like him. She looked at me and I could feel her sympathy for the death of my daughters. A tear ran down her cheek. Let us hope the peacemaker is alive, she said. While you sharpen your weapons, I will pray for a miracle. The Mohawk chief was transformed by her words and nodded. The other woman stepped in to console her, and we all quietly walked back to camp. When we arose in the morning, smoke from the river's edge caught our attention. We hurried down to find the peacemaker sitting by a fire, patiently waiting for us. 
The elder clan mother draped a blanket across his shoulders and release spread among us. Filled with emotion, the Mohawk chief agreed to follow us in his canoe to the land of the Onondaga to confront Chief Tadadapo. Together we paddled as four nations. The wicked Tadadapo lived separately from his people. Bands of warriors stood guard day and night. When we arrived, they yelled and pushed us away. The peacemaker kept his hand by his side to discourage violence, but the chiefs and I pushed back. A figure appeared in the doorway of the dwelling, hunched over, withered and twisted. Tadadaho was a horrifying sight. Sickness from the evil within had taken over his body. Scales covered much of his skin, and snakes slithered through his hair onto his shoulders. No words came from his mouth. Instead, a forked tongue produced a thick, hissing sound. My anger returned, and I wanted to destroy Tadadaho. The chiefs continued to push against the warriors. The fighting grew until something unexpected happened. A soft, haunting melody of purity and truth came floating through the air, spellbound, all lowered the weapons. The hymn was coming from the lips of the peacemaker. His melody had stopped the fighting as the song drifted through the air, the moon crossed in front of the sun, darkening the blue sky. The miracle stunned the warriors, and they pulled back in fear. But the rest of us were enchanted by the glory of the hymn, and we joined in singing. Tadadaho cursed the sky, waving his scepter and showing no sign of fear. The peacemaker finished his singing and the moon passed, revealing the sun again, more beautiful than before. The peacemaker asked me to make medicine for Tadadaho's sickness. He said, where there is darkness, we must bring light, and that is by forgiving that we are set free. I gathered roots and herbs for the medicine, but how could I help heal a man who had brought me such misery? How could I forgive him? Yet I put my heart and soul into the potion, and with this action, my anger disappeared. I entered the hut with the medicine paste and fresh water. I explained every day that some of the paste must be mixed with the water and drunk. Tadadaho grabbed the medicine from my hands and drank. His strained breathing eased. The evil look in his eyes softened. He appeared to wonder why a man whom he'd brought so much pain would help to heal him. The peacemaker told Tadadaho that we would return in three days and to continue taking the medicine. We traveled back to the people of the Cayuga, Mohawk, Seneca, and Oneida and told them of our encounter. On the third day, a mass of people followed us to the land of the Onondaga to see Chief Tadadaho once again. Tadadaho's voice had returned, but he was still hunched over and sickly. The peacemaker approached him with all the tribes watching, placed his hand above his head and chanted. Tadadaho let out a scream, and the snake slithered from his hair into the grass where they belonged. Everyone followed the peacemaker to a tall white pine. He placed his hand on my back, and once again I spoke to him. People of all nations must now come together as one. Beneath this tree, we shall bury all our weapons of war. This will symbolize the end of our fighting. The men uprooted the white pine and threw their weapons into the hole. Now we will replant this tree, and it shall be called the Tree of Peace. As I looked at Tadadaho, the scales on his skin began to disappear. The peacemaker placed his fist over his heart, and again I spoke. As five nations, we will bring forth peace, power, and righteousness. The women of our tribe shall appoint the chiefs, and as one people, we shall live under the protection of the great law. All voices will be heard as we now vote before action is taken. I looked at Tadadaho, and the once crooked man now stood upright. Atop this great white pine shall live an eagle that will look over all five nations, and the eagle shall be with you, Tadadaho. You will be a great keeper of peace and the protector of all people. The men and women of the Mohawk nation began to stomp their feet in unison. Clapping came from the Cayuga. A chant formed between the Onondaga and the Oneida and the Seneca pound of drums. The rhythm grew louder in perfect time and the melody soared through the pines. I looked over at Tadadaho, but he was gone. A beautiful scream echoed through the woodlands. And as five nations, we looked up to see an eagle perched atop the tree of peace.
historical note. Hiawatha and the Peacemaker are thought to have lived in the 14th century. Before Europeans arrived in North America, the Peacemaker, whose birth name was Tiganawida, was a spiritual leader who was known for his sacred powers. Historians believe he had a speech impediment, that he chose Hiawatha to accompany him because Hiawatha was a gifted speaker. The two men journeyed across what is now Upper New, New York State in, in Ontario and Quebec, Canada, to unite the five nations of the Iroquois people who have been at war, the Cayugas, the Senecas, the Oneidas, the Mohawks, and the Onondagas. Much later, in 1722, the Tus Tuscarora Nation joined this disunited league, and it became the Six Nations Iroquois Confederacy. Officially, it was known as the the Haudenosaunee, or the people of the Longhouse. This meant that the Iroquois were one family and could live in peace under one roof. The peacemaker's message of the great law of peace pledged peace amongst the among the nations by giving each tribe a special role in how the Iroquois governed themselves. Each village and clan would choose a chief to represent it at the Council of Tribes. All decisions were made by consensus at the council, meaning that all voices had an equal importance. Men and women shared power. It is said that the great law of peace is the oldest participatory democracy on, and it had much influence on the Benjamin Franklin, John Hancock, Thomas Jefferson, and the authors of the Constitution of the, of the United States, who also supported self-government and a peaceful union. To this day, the Six Nations live in unity, harmony, and peace based on the teachings of the Great Law from the Peacemaker and his disciple, Hiawatha. <laughs> hey, thanks for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed the book, Hiawatha and the Peacemaker. We had a really great time reading it for you guys today. And if you happen to like the story that you heard today, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe on the down below. And with, uh, we'll see you guys later on the next video. Peace! peace.